Welcome to the Multifamily Investor Nation podcast. I'm your host, Dan Hanford, and this is a podcast is sponsored by CoStar. And with us today, we have a special guest with us, Jonathan Twomley. Welcome to the podcast, Jonathan. Thanks for having me, Dan. Good to be here. Well, looking forward to diving into this portfolio deal that you guys exited. Uh, I think it was last year, wasn't it? That's right. Just about exactly a year ago. So about in, in about uh, March of 2019. And yeah. uh, this is a portfolio that consists of four assets, uh, B and C class assets, 404 units in total. The smallest asset in this portfolio was 54 units. And the largest asset in this portfolio was 132 units. And this, this, this uh, group of assets is located in, Green, in the Greenville Spartanburg area. So partially in Greenville, partially in Spartanburg. And before we dive into this particular portfolio and the sale, because most of you who are listening, you probably hear us talk a lot more about the acquisition side, about how are we actually finding deals and closing deals. But I also like to bring on guests like Jonathan that has actually exited a property. So we can talk about that other side of it as well on the disposition side. So before we dive into this, Jonathan, why don't you give the listeners a little bit about your background and where you are right now in the multifamily space? Yeah. So, uh, Answering that last question first, I'm actually completely exited at the moment, don't own anything, sold everything that we owned last year. Uh, we'll obviously get into the whys and wheres about that during the podcast. But um, my background originally was as a lawyer up here in New York City um, and I did uh, commercial litigation. At the end of my career as a lawyer, I was doing a lot of real estate related litigation. So I represented a lot of hotel owners. Uh, who were fighting against hotel chains. And as a result of that, got really, really good uh, background in management contracts and, and stuff like that, from, because that's what we were fighting over uh, quite a bit was the uh, trying to terminate the managers of the hotel. So those management contracts were, were similar to what you see in multifamily. Um, and uh, I got into the business in 2011. Um, I was kind of like a belated casualty of the uh, great financial crisis. I, I got downsized about two years after it happened, um, but not something that I was at all upset about. I'd really been t looking to get out. I was pretty tired of being a lawyer. And I was in a good, you know, sort of fortunate position that when I did get uh, terminated from my job, I had savings to fall back on. I had kind of the option to figure out what I wanted to do next. And you know, what I decided to do was, uh, was go into multifamily. I wound up hooking up with um, someone else I met in the city, another investor, who was trying to build a syndication business. I had no idea what syndication was when, uh, before I met her. Uh, we were running after deals in Louisiana and Texas for a couple of years together before we wrapped up that partnership. And I went out on my own in 2013 and formed the company that I have now, which is Two Bridges Asset, Two Bridges Asset Management, uh, which owned that asset, those assets that we'll talk about today. Well, let's kind of dive into this asset, these portfolio, this portfolio, because I know when we were talking a little bit about this in the green room, we talked, you mentioned that you didn't buy these as a portfolio deal, but you actually sold them as a portfolio. Yeah. So can you give us like kind of a, of a background about, you know, what it was about these assets that you liked and what was the original business plan on them and kind of the whole process, you know, in a nutshell, if you can, on, you know, the whole process up to the point of, you know, to make the decision of you wanting to actually sell these assets. Yeah, so uh, I had actually always intended to try to exit as a portfolio. So that was kind of the exit plan from the beginning. My, my theory, which I also ultimately didn't actually really get to test, but my, my theory was that uh, given that institutional buyers wanted to buy larger assets, that they might buy, you know, if you assembled a bunch of smaller properties into a portfolio that was a big enough size for them to want to take, they would buy it as a portfolio and they would pay their kind of compressed cap rates that the institutions often pay for the, for, for bigger, you know, slices of property. So that was, that was actually my, my thinking going in to this. Um, we ultimately sold to a non-institutional buyer and that we can get into that later, but um, you know, that was the original exit plan in terms of why I bought those particular assets. Um, you know, just like, to be honest, when I started out, you know, I didn't have the level of sophistication I have now. I was kind of feeling my way through the business and bought the stuff that, uh, that I was able to get my hands on, you know, essentially, um, at least certainly the first couple. Um, and, you know, went through the underwriting process the best that I could and, you know, raised the money and took them down. But there wasn't any, you know, I, I guess it was sort of strategically, 
there were a couple other things going on. I mean, I thought that, you know, I was really going after C assets because I thought they would make better returns. Um, certainly traded at higher cap rates for sure. Um, and I also wanted to own assets close together. I didn't think it made sense to try to run all over the country buying, you know, assets here, there, and everywhere. I thought if you bought them all close together, then you could manage them together, try to get some economies of scale together, uh, big contracts out together, things like that that would help you control costs a little more than running, you know, all over the place, as well as just the, the mental bandwidth of not having to, um, to run all over the country looking after your assets. Uh, I like the South Carolina market or several markets in South Carolina because of the growth that was going on there population wise, you know, sustained growth for a very long period of time. Uh, and the fact that it was, for me, it was easy to access from New York. So as opposed to going to Texas, which, you know, literally was like a two day trip to get there from New York by the time you got through with all the flying and the driving and everything to the asset. Uh, stuff in South Carolina, you know, I could take the first flight out from, you know, LaGuardia here in New York City to Charlotte, you know, drive down in an hour, do my business and then get, you know, get back to Charlotte in time for the last flight out and be home, you know, there and back in a day, or maybe stay over one night if I had to. But that was impossible with stuff in Texas and Louisiana that I'd been looking at before. It was basically a minimum like three, four day trip to do anything out there. So um, just in terms of the, you know, the, what I, how I wanted to be running my life uh, made sense to be looking at stuff in South Carolina for me. So let me ask you, you had mentioned earlier just a minute and when you were talking about the, the C-class assets and making mm -hmm. more money and things like that, has your thought process changed kind of now with knowing what you know now? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I would approach things very differently if I were starting out now as, with the C-class property. The, the first thing about C-class, I think your strategy has to be very different in this stage of the market than it would be when I started out. When I started out, you were able to buy C-class assets at, you know, eight, nine, 10 caps, right? And you could just buy them and run them. And frankly, that was the strategy. The strategy was not, I'm gonna go and make my money by investing a whole lot of capital in this and repositioning it. The strategy was, I'm just gonna come in here, I'm gonna buy from a mom and pop, I'm gonna run it better than they do, I'm gonna combine it with other assets and get some economies of scale, bring in professional management, that sort of thing, and just run it better. And we'll just kind of take care of the, maintenance and stuff as we go and you kind of upgrade upgrade units as we go but there wasn't any 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 plan to or need to do any kind of major repositioning at the time um, what i learned along the way was i was very very concerned probably overly concerned with my returns my investor returns and in, in those early deals not that you shouldn't be concerned with it but i guess what i what i mean was i was so you know like in my ignorance of how these things work, I was so concerned about like, you know, maybe like a half a point difference in annual projected returns that I didn't raise enough money to establish a big reserve fund for those properties, which is something that if you're looking at C-class properties, you absolutely need to do because those properties have a lot of things that just crop up on them that you're not expecting. Even if you, you know, you have your full engineering report, you're doing all that stuff in due diligence. Nevertheless, like you just don't know you know, when that water main break is gonna give way, right? And where it's gonna break, you know, where it breaks, <laughs> if the thing breaks like in the middle of your yard, like digging it up is a lot different proposition than when it breaks under your foundation and you've got to dig up the foundation, get to the, get to the water main, you know, fix the water main, rebuild your foundation and then, you know, and then be done. So those all kinds of things like that that just come up with C properties, if you're not really, really well capitalized for it's either coming out of cash flow and then really impinging your returns or you've got to make capital calls which you know thank goodness i didn't have to but it did it did really uh, mess with the cash flow having to finance those those repairs so that's one thing um another thing that i think i didn't really fully appreciate about the c properties is just the amount of delinquency that you that you run into delinquency and bad debt you know you're you're dealing with a, a tenant base that is not doesn't have a lot to fall back on, right? And it's it's going to be you know service jobs or maybe manufacturing jobs where the hours are you know not certain or they're, you know they're they're subject to fluctuation depending on the the needs of the factory. 
and you know people places especially in places like like you know suburban south carolina and the upstate folks got to have cars to get to do anything so if they run into trouble you know not having a car is like a death sentence they're they're gonna not pay their rent if they have to make a choice between the, the car payment and, and the rent so uh you have to really plan a lot for that kind of delinquency and, and bad debt and you have to be really really careful with tenant selection and uh so that's like another thing that that i didn't know about getting into those assets i think you know going forward my focus will be a lot different really focusing more on the b assets uh especially b assets that as we come into the next cycle you know b assets that have been in the same hands for a long time uh ready for a refresh you know do a little bit more of a, a value add upgrade uh, program on the properties but you know newer properties that just have you know the systems are younger they're not as beat up they're not as likely to start breaking on you because they're you know 20 years younger than say the c properties uh, and and a, a, a stronger tenant base they just have tenants that have more research more resources to fall back on uh you know so you're not dealing with the same level of delinquency and, and bad debt not not that not that we had none of it on our b properties but just a lot less of it it wasn't wasn't a critical issue on those properties just more of an annoyance so between spartanburg and greenville south carolina mm -hmm. which one had the uh the higher you know uh bad tenants if you will I, spartanburg definitely had uh was not as strong i mean but also that has to do also kind of with the properties that we owned as well it wasn't simply to say like hey people in spartanburg are not as good as people in greenville <laughs> sure. or anything like that like it's not that wasn't the issue uh you know you know what one major difference between those two markets is that in in greenville the property taxes are much better in spartanburg the property taxes are much higher especially if you're in the city of spartanburg you had to pay a lot more property tax um but then in terms of the tenant base uh you know we had one c property in the greenville area and and two in the um, Spartanburg area. And I think that the difference between those properties in terms of um, their delinquency was that the, the, the property that we had in uh, the uh, Greenville area was, it was a stronger market. And even though the tenant profile was similar, there was a better school district there. It was a, just a more desirable market. And I think that attracted a tenant base that was, uh, more um i don't want to say diligent but like more concerned about making sure they paid their rent and not getting booted out of their apartment because i think it attracted more families and you know people who were there for the schools so i think that was that was a big defining difference uh between the two what did you what were, i know you had mentioned uh that you didn't have a lot of capex dollars i think is what you mentioned on mm -hmm. these assets in the very beginning because i wasn't doing the plan did you have any renovation dollars up front and did you do any renovations so, or was that kind of not part of the plan so we did on so the, the properties that we bought were so three, three of them actually did just go through major renovations from the seller that we bought them from right so there wasn't really a lot to do on the, on the properties in terms of, you know, upgrades or whatever. Um, but on one of them, we, we did sort of ironically enough, like that, the property that we wound up putting the most money into and actually doing the best with was one that I had to make an offer on before I even visited the property. And I, I got onto, um, it was sort of a, it was an off market thing came up very suddenly uh the seller wanted to move fast it was shown to us and a couple of other groups and um i wasn't able to get down there in time before i had before the the initial bid was due it was literally like i had like 48 hours to make a decision on it so i got onto uh, to google and was looking at the thing from google street view and on street view it kind of looked pretty rough and as a result of that, I, I probably made a less generous offer than I would have otherwise because I was had to build in more risk because I didn't know what I was getting into and also kind of allocated more than I had planned than I would have otherwise to um, to upgrades and we wound up you know winning the bid we had, we upped a bit a little bit but it was still pretty reasonable we wound up getting the, the property for and then we had this all this upgrade money allocated to it 
but we actually spent the money on all that money went to exterior upgrades. We didn't do anything to the units. Um, but doing the exterior upgrades, I think, sent the message that, hey, there's a new sheriff in town. Um, you know, we got new signage, which is something I really recommend. Um, we got, we did a lot of repainting, kind of like changed the color scheme of the, the exteriors. We did, you know, we revamped the leasing office, which was, you know, important, made it, you know, the first impression that the new tenants had was of a nicer, leasing office and we did a lot of landscaping stuff like that so even though we didn't upgrade the units at that time we, later on we did it we did because that property performed really really well we had a lot of extra cash um, to use for upgrades we wound up doing upgrades later on in the in the hold but it wasn't something that we was part of the plan but we did plan on doing these exterior upgrades which i think made a, a big difference in terms of uh, who we were able to attract and you know how much rent we were able to to drive so you had mentioned economies of scale earlier on as well uh did you find that you were able to kind of benefit from that and with having these assets so close to each other we were able to benefit from a little bit in terms of being able to bid out uh some services like you know, some turns and um i think trash collection wound up being there two different markets we couldn't do trash collection together I think we were able to do landscaping from the same folks. Um, so we didn't wind up actually having as much economies of scale on that end of things. In the, for the Spartan, sorry, for the Greenville properties though, that smaller, so the smallest one we owned and the biggest one we owned were very close together. And we were able to actually then use uh, staff. So basically we, we staffed the smaller one with part-timers who were based at the larger property. And that wound up saving a lot of money because we didn't need to have, you know, essentially full-time staff for a small property or trying to find part-timers, which can be very difficult. You know, trying to find half-time manager, half-time maintenance guy can be very tough. So uh, we were able to, to just send people over, uh, you know, or, or have them based at both properties and have, you know, have them part-time at both rather than trying to find an independent part-time. So that actually worked out pretty well in, in keeping the cost down at that small property. Now, another question I had, you had mentioned earlier about uh, uh, you know, having to get financing to do some of the repairs and things like that. And you didn't have to do capital calls. Was that financing like a, from an outside lender? Or was that you actually being able to put an infusing capital into the project? So it depended on the property. Uh, on some of them, we just financed it out of cash flow. Right. So, um, but on, on one, we had one property in Spartanburg that just had like, I think everybody in your career will have one of these, but it's just the property where just nothing goes right. And, uh, you know, through you do all your due diligence and it just, you know, things just don't work. So that property had just a lot of maintenance issues come up as well as, uh, you know, uh, fires and, mold issues and all sorts of stuff. Uh, that one we wound up financing like from corporate essentially. So we didn't go to our investors to, to put in extra money for that. We just financed the liquidity issues from the, the cash that we had at the corporate level. So that expression that you just had that, oh, that kind of exasperated <laughs> feeling is, is yeah. exactly one of the reasons why I don't like buying C-class assets today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Although, I mean, honestly, like, you know, some of the things that happened on that property were not things that were at all related to it being C-class, you know, fi fi fires will break out and that can happen anywhere. You know, that's not, that's not a C-class issue per se. Um, the, the mold issue was actually really a manager caused issue. We had the first manager we had on the, on the site just was completely derelict in her duty and she didn't check down units in the summer <laughs> so mm. she just let you know there was a unit that had a leak and no no ac was on to keep it dried out and uh and she never left behind her desk and then you know when she finally went to look at the unit like three months later uh, the thing was completely covered with mold so uh, we actually had a couple of units that that happened at the same time because of the, that same issue so uh so make sure your managers are walking the property and checking down you, you know checking the vacant units all the time to make sure that you don't have issues like this because stuff happens when you get leaks from upstairs, you know, somebody clogs the toilet and then overflows and it leaks into the apartment downstairs. And if you're not on top of it, 
it can wind up being a huge, you know, a minor problem can become a huge problem if you're not on top of stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, that word to the wise. But yeah, I agree with you about, about the, we had, we had the, um, in terms of the seed property, we had the, we had the water main break of the month, you know, for a while on one of our properties to the point where every time I saw my manager's phone on my caller ID, I just was like, do I really want to answer this? Like, do I want to, do I want to hear what this, what my manager has to say? Because he's probably calling me to tell me that like, oh yeah, Jonathan, we have another $10,000 water main break for uh for you to deal with so um yeah so c properties i agree with you completely now did you guys end up putting any supplemental loans or refinancing any of these um assets while you had them under management no and i wish we we could have but we we couldn't because so when i got started a very different environment from where things are now where you know lenders are throwing money at you uh you know it's it's a very it's it's easier to qualify for Fannie and Freddie debt. Uh, when I started out, I was, you know, turned down by everybody, uh, including the community banks, because the community banks were like, "Well, you don't live in South Carolina, so we're not going to lend to you." Um, they had all been, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of the community banks in the upstate had been burned really badly by out-of-state investors during the financial crisis who just walked away from stuff. So they. When I went down and started talking to community banks, they said, well, if you buy a condo down here, then we'll consider you an instater and we'll <laughs> land to you. But, you know, unless, and I was like, I don't really want to buy a condo down here. Like, I'm not going to spend that much time down here. So, um, so I wound up having to do CMBS debt. And with CMBS debt, you can't supplement it or resize it or anything. So that, that made it a little, you know, hard to sell because uh but first the first time we went out to sell um because we wanted to we didn't want to pay defeasance so we tried to do loan assumptions which frankly nobody wanted to do because we had so much capital growth that it made it very hard for people to find to kind of make the numbers work um but yeah we couldn't we couldn't do any kind of resizing or supplementing with those cmbs loans so for the listeners that are listening right now, they've probably have heard us talk about agency loans and private bridge loans and things like that. They might not have heard of the CMBS debt. Can you describe to them a little bit kind of what that actually is and what that entails? Yeah, absolutely. So CMBS stands for uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities. And so what happens is when you do a CMBS loan, it is packaged up into a bunch of other, like into a product that is then sold on to other investors. It's, it's securitized. And, um, they, because of that, the end investors of these, of these pools of mortgages are very, very conservative investors who are just looking to lock in that, whatever that spread is. I mean, the spreads aren't very big. They can be getting like 2% or 2.5% uh, on their money, but they're, it's supposed to be like practically as safe as a T-bill, right? And the... Um, and they're diversifying their risk across like many mortgages. But as a result of that, there's like no flexibility. They want to lock in their payments for, uh, for the whole term. They want to get that count. They're buying that stream of payments for the, for the whole like 10 year term of the loan or whatever. And they're very, very strict about protecting those cash flows. So they don't want, any kind of like other liens on the property. They don't want anything, anything that they could possibly imagine that could somehow interfere with them getting that, that money. And they also really discourage you um, against say refinancing even with, you know, defeasance and yield maintenance, which essentially, you know, because those, the way that those work is, you know, when you go to, if you want to prepay the loan, you have to recreate that stream of payments. Right, so you have to buy treasury bills that are maturing on the exact dates that the payments would be due, and in order to create that stream of payments, as you know how that like you know interest rates work with bonds, you know the more expensive the bond, the lower the interest rate, and vice versa. So there's a disincentive to refinance your mortgage when insurance rates drop because it makes your defe- your defeasance payment bigger. Right, so. Um, that, so you have, you're subject to those kinds of restrictions too. And then the other thing about CMBS that I really disliked was just the servicing is very, very 
they have very little room to maneuver the servers, the servicers, because they're reporting to like these special services and they're all like, trying to maintain this like very, very strict cash flow. So they don't, they really have like very little room to, to maneuver. And frankly, sometimes I think that some of the stuff that they do is actually counterproductive uh, in terms of you managing the asset. So um, it's, it's a, they're difficult loan programs, but they're, the, the advantage of CMBS is that you can usually lock in really good interest rates for long, for a long term. So if you're prepared to deal with the servicing, you can get very, very good rates um, with CMBS and, and they will lend on assets that Fannie and Freddie don't typically land on or, and they'll lend on, they'll lend to people who can't qualify for agency debt like I did at the time. So that's sort of the, you know, the, the plus and the minus of it. So kind of going through this, kind of looking back in the years that you owned these four assets, sounds like you definitely have learned a lot throughout the process, you know, a lot of, you know, bumps and bruises, but also I'm sure some, some positive things at the same time. What, uh, what would you say is the, is the biggest challenge that you had to overcome throughout this process? Not, not the disposition yet. We're going to get to that in a minute, yeah. but really kind of like during that hold period where some of the, what was one of the biggest challenges that you had to get over? Yeah. I mean, I'd say like the biggest challenge, frankly, was the, was mental, right? When things are going wrong, and you've got investors who are expecting to be paid and you're not getting paid on the asset if they're not getting paid. Like that is, that, that's tough stuff to deal with, frankly. And um, especially when you're doing it full time and you're like, you're not, this isn't a part-time side gig for you while you've got some other career that's, you know, keeping you fed, keeping a roof over your head, but running this as your, as your sole business, uh, that's pretty stressful. Right. And, uh, just having to like, just keep on pushing forward. And, you know, I, I, I think it, I never had any problem with my investors. And the reason was because I really communicated with them. I always let them know what was going on. You know, nobody ever had to reach out to me to say, Jonathan, what's going on? I haven't heard from you in a long time. And I think because of that, um, I, I, I wound up not, like maintaining really good relationships with my investors throughout difficult times. In fact, I, I sometimes would email investors with like this litany of what was happening on the property. And um, I get, I get emails back from my investors saying, Jonathan, it's okay. Just don't worry about it so much. Right. It's all right. This is just, you know, this is just like, you know, investment money for me. I'm not living on this. So, uh, but I think that I got those responses back because I was so proactive about, uh, about informing people. And also, I think, it, even though I wasn't trying to do this, like, I think I communicated that this mattered to me. Like, it really, I was concerned about them, about my investors, and felt a, a responsibility towards them. And I think that that, you know, when you do that, it, it goes a long way to, to maintaining those good relationships with investors through tough times. So the opposite of that question now, what would you say was one of the things that was kind of the easiest throughout the entire process? Well, I mean, you know, in that portfolio, we had a range of properties, you know, from one that was, like I said, the kind of problem of the week to one that just minted money, you know, and to the point where I, you know, often scratching my head, like, why is this making so much money? Like, is there something, am I, are the financials wrong? Like, is this really making that much money? And, um, you know, that was the property that ironically I bought with the, like I said, I went in very, very, very conservatively because I couldn't see it before I had to make a bid. Um, and we were just lucky because we got it off market and we weren't really competing with a lot of other sellers. And it was still early enough in the cycle that the, sorry, we weren't competing with a lot of buyers and it was early enough in the cycle that the sellers hadn't gotten really, really greedy yet. I mean, this seller in particular was looking to, they were actually looking to get, to raise cash early in the cycle so they could reinvest in, and they were actually a construction company. They, they were looking at, at a, they were looking at ahead and going, oh, we see where this is going. Like we, we want to start building some assets really soon. So they were looking to free up cash. So I think their interest was just moving fast and they weren't trying to maximize every dollar on this thing. Um, and, you know, so go, you know, the thing that I learned here was the, the price you buy these assets at really matters. Like it really, 
makes a huge difference to your returns. And, and that asset just, like I said, it just, it just, it was just an ATM machine, just printed money. It was easy to run, no problems, you know, so that can happen too. But I think the, 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 um, the critical factor there is really, I mean, there was like a lot of good things going on with that asset, good location, uh, you know, desirable school system, uh, you know, and just the, the price that we bought it at. We're all, you know, winded our backs, right, for that. Mm -hmm. So let's talk now about the disposition now, because, you know, you had these assets since 2000 and what, 13? 14, 14? 2014, 2014, 2015 is when we bought. Okay, so 2014, yeah. 2015, you held on to them for a couple, for several years, yeah. and you're now making the decision to sell. So what was it that kind of brought you to that decision to now offload these assets? Yeah, so it wasn't, it, it was a, process. It wasn't like a, an immediate snap decision. Uh, what actually the sort of, I guess the trigger for it, you know, we're sort of getting, you're getting into 2018, 2019. Uh, you're starting to have, the market is really heating up and, you know, I'm fielding calls constantly from brokers who are asking, you know, would we, we'd be interested in selling. And the answer was always no. Uh, but um, that, that one property that, you know, that the, the problem of the month club property we had back in 2017, I think it was, we had, we had two major fires in the space of about five weeks on that property, probably both tenant caused. They were, we never found out the cause of the fire, the fire department in both cases said the fire was so bad. There was no evidence left of the fire, but given the time of day that they happened, I think that they, were people like, you know, leaving their stove on and walking out of the house kind of thing, you know, causing a fire that way. And because it happened, they both happened like right around the time people were leaving for work. So um, the investor in that deal, we only had one investor in that deal. And he said, hey, look, Jonathan, I'm just, we just sell this thing. I'm just tired of dealing with this. Like, let's just sell it. So <clears throat> that got me thinking along, uh, like a thought process that started out with, well, should we just sell this or should we try to package them up and sell them all together? And um, I decided, you know, let's go for, let's swing through the fences and see if we can sell the whole thing, especially since I had said that that was really my plan from the beginning <clears throat> was to try to sell them uh, as a package. And what happened was though, that with the, when we went out to the market the first time, I, I was, I really didn't want to pay these defeasance penalties and stuff. So I wanted to find an assumption buyer. And because the market had just exploded over the time that we had held these properties, you know, you couldn't, because with CMBS debt, people couldn't add supplemental debt. They would have to assume it and they couldn't, they couldn't do anything other than just assume it as it was. What happened was that we had so much capital growth that people would be buying it like 50% leverage and they couldn't make the numbers work. So we wound up not, we got a couple of offers or really nothing, you know, we knew what the value of the property was. The offers we were getting weren't close. And um, we wound up first going into contract for that one, the sort of the fire damaged property uh, without the others. And I was sort of very specific. I told people like, you could buy these two, or you, you, could, you could buy this one, you could buy this one, you could buy all four, but you can't like, you can't buy the two best ones for me. And those are not for sale unless you buy everything. Um, and we wound up going in, into contract only on that kind of really troublesome asset. But we wound up never, we didn't actually go into contract. We went deep into negotiations. We could never get a signed contract because we could never work out the issue of uh, we were still in the process of rebuilding those down, you know, those fire damage units. And we could never come to an agreement on how we were going to work that out, you know, like the insurance proceeds and, and how we, you know, how we were going to protect ourselves and how they were going to protect themselves. So we wound up saying, you know what, we'll just take them off the market and think about this some other time. And over the course of the next year, interest rates started going up. And that defeasance penalty started becoming less and less onerous 
and I realize like, hey, if I sell them um, and just eat the defeasance, then we're actually going to make like we're way ahead of where we expected to be with these properties, even with eating those defeasance penalties and stuff. So uh, actually didn't put them back on the market, but it just became a little more open-minded when people called me to, to look at them. And then what literally happened was somebody called me, broker I knew uh, down in South Carolina called me up and said, Hey, would you think about selling your assets? And, you know, I, I threw out this number, which was really designed, designed to, to get a no. Um, and he said, I'll take it to my client. And they said, yes, which surprised me a lot. Cause I, it was a, it was a, it was a pretty long stretch price that I threw out there, uh, but they were, they were happy with, you know, they, they agreed to it. So uh, there was a little bit of horse trading that went on afterwards, but uh, we still got the deal done for, I think it was like 25, five altogether for the four assets, which was great considering that I think we were in for 17, five on all four of them. So just in four, four and a half years, it was an $8 million profit. So how, how did you, how long did it end up taking? Well, before I go to that, I'm, I was asking yeah. one other question, but before I dive into that, were you able to lock in the actual rate for disposition to be able to lock in so you kind of knew what no. the decent was? Or is that so all of the bad closing? So that's the big, that's the other big problem with defeasance was now we went into contract and the, the price that we negotiated was really um, at, well, let's see how let me reconstruct this. So we went into contract at a point where um, interest rates were at their peak of 2018. So just at the point where they reached their highest point, which was great for the feasance. We went into contract at that, at that price. And then what wound up happening was the seller came, sorry, the buyer came back to us and you know, I, I, I met with them and they said, look, we're, we're just gonna lay our cards on the table. Like we can't get enough proceeds to do the deal at, with interest rates where they are. We need, you know, we needed to take a haircut. So we negotiated a price reduction uh, to get it within the proceeds they needed to be. It was still a great price for us. Um, and, but then what happened was right after that happened, then interest rates started to decline. And so they wound up getting like this kind of windfall because their interest rates went down, but for, it hurt me because you know, every day I'm watching interest rates go down and I, you couldn't, you can't lock it in on the way out, right? You can't lock in that defeasance rate because they literally buy those securities like the day of closing. So that's, you know, A, nerve wracking, B, lost me you know, considerable amount, amount of money through, you know, just dumb luck in the market. And um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's a big reason why I also don't like doing defeasance and probably won't do it again because you just, you're, it's a moving target. You just don't know what you're going to get. Like, I, you know, for, we just had, you know, the Fed cut rate suddenly without warning 50 basis points the other day. If you were trying to sell a property and you were defeasing it, I mean, you just got whacked upside the head mm. out of the blue. It didn't, it wasn't that precipitous with me, but, but effectively it was about the same. It must've gone, the interest rates must, must've dropped about 50 basis points in that time. And uh, maybe even more. And, um, <clears throat> but if you were like an environment now where you just were selling and trying to, do, you were already in contract and your price was set and there was really nothing you could do about it at this point, you know, you're, you can't really go back to the buyer and say, I want more money. Like that's not gonna fly. Uh, and, you know, with the, the Fed, you know, people now predicting the Fed is going to drop rate, you know, rates another 75 basis points in two weeks, which would be insane. But if it happens, I mean, if you're talking about like a full point and a half swing downwards, like suddenly you're making a lot less money on that deal than you thought, because you're, depending on the size of the deal, I mean, you could be talking like millions of dollars in difference. In, in that penalty that you have to, it's not a penalty, but to buy, the, to buy that basket of treasury bills to recreate that stream of payments, um, that's a huge hit. So I, you know, you get a better interest rate with CMBS in most cases, but I would rather pay a few extra basis points to get a step down that, and, and know, you know, and be able to just calculate what my prepayment penalty is 
and have that certainty to just be able to work it into my sale underwriting than to have to deal with CMBS. And, you know, I think like at the, listen, seven, eight years ago, people were taking defeasance because they were like, rates are historically low. I'm going to, I'm going to make a bet that rates are going to go up. And if they go up, I mean, if they go up enough, you could theoretically actually make money on your defeasance, right? Because you would have to lay out so little money to recreate that stream of payments if interest rates went up enough because the security, the underlying securities would drop. But, you know, so I think a lot of people, myself included, were like, hey, interest rates have never been this low before. If they're going anywhere, they're going up. You know, I'm, I'm not going to take a bet that 10 years from now, interest rates are going to be higher or lower than they are now. I'm going to bet that they're going to be higher. That didn't happen. They've gone the other direction. Uh, so I think a lot of people have been hurt. So I'm, I wouldn't take that risk again myself. I just want to have like, just tell me what it is. What, what check do I have to write and, and let me be done with it. So you, this is now right now, March, we're at March 10th, 2020. Yeah. You know, the, the, the T bills are, you know, down below 1% all time lows. Are we making a bet right now? It's going to go up or wh- wh- where are we at right now? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not taking that bet anymore. I mean, yeah. it's, things just seem to be going the other direction. And I don't know how, honestly, like we actually are going to reflate the economy. So um, I think they're going to go down and stay down for a while. Yeah. Which is why even on the LIBOR curve is, is down for the next 10 years. You know, well, the forward curve, even though LIBOR, you know, is going to be going away or going to be replacing it with SOFR and all this other kind of stuff. But I think it's still a good kind of benchmark right now, which is the only thing we really have to go off of. So how long did it actually take you from the time that uh, you had that phone call to the broker and they accepted to actually sell it? Was it, tip- was it a typical 30-30 or was there extensions built in that they opted for or what kind of was that it, process? It dragged on for a while because actually getting the contract itself negotiated took quite a while, right? And there wasn't, since, there, since it was a completely off-market deal, there weren't other potential buyers in the process. There, the sellers didn't move that quickly because there was there wasn't pressure on them so um it took a while to negotiate the contract we had to work out this a bunch of escrows because we had you know we were still in construction on that one property on you know rebuilding uh from the fires and all that had to be worked out so it took quite a while and once we so i think it actually took us like good four or five months to actually get into contract finally and then once we were in contract then it was you know your standard i mean i think it was 90 days or something it wasn't like, it wasn't like a super accelerated process i think if we had done uh if we just gone back to the market with a regular auction process and and said hey we're just going to eat the defeasance this time and had multiple bidders and i think we probably would have had people coming in you know claiming they could get it done in 30 days or 60 days or whatever but since it was off market it wasn't that kind of you know, hurry up and hurry up kind of process. So can you talk to us and walk us through kind of what the returns looked like on these deals now that you actually exited them and what kind of investors were able to achieve on them or anything? Uh, are we allowed to? Is this going to... That's up. I don't know if you're allowed to or not, depending on what kind of offering you did, but that's up to you. Well, I mean, what I mean is uh, like seeding the market. I mean, I'm not currently doing deals, so it's probably okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had... Look, our investors range from on the low end uh, on the, the property that was just sucking wind all the time, uh, making 50% on their money all the way up to on that property that was minting money, like over 200% um, on their money. So it was a good range of outcomes. Um, but, you know, honestly, we had the we had the wind at our back, right? We bought at the right time in the cycle. We exited it at the right time in the cycle. I don't think that those, you know, results are replicable. Even if we had the same basket of assets and bought them now, um, that the deal it sucked wind. I mean, I think it'd be losing money. And the one of the at, that did super well. I mean, it would make money, but it just wouldn't make that kind of those kinds of returns, um, just because we'd be paying a premium for it, and we just there's not a lot of additional kind of upside at this point in, in the cycle. So, um, but yeah, I mean, everybody was quite happy with the returns that they got. Uh, I think especially the guy who wanted to sell and just get out uh, was very happy with the fact that he made money, you know, a lot more money than he expected. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was happy with the way things turned out. 
or come up against the clock here and I have, uh, uh, before I have you kind of give your contact information, things like mm -hmm. that, uh, is there any last minute kind of, you know, things or tips that you want to give to anybody about this kind of process that you went through from, you know, acquisition all the way to the disposition on the other end of it? Uh, I mean, I think sort of in the final analysis, it really matters. You know, people don't talk about this a whole lot anymore, but you, you got to buy right. Like you make money on the buy. And I think, I think that that has been really kind of pushed aside over the last couple of years as property prices have hit, you know, sort of cap rates have hit the, the lowest that they're at and, uh, you know, properties have gone to the kind of prices of the trading at. I, I think uh, people have lost sight of the fact that it, that the price that you buy at and the price that you sell at, I mean, it seems pretty simple, but, you know, buy low and sell high is still the way to make money. And uh, it's more difficult to do that now. I think people are investing not really with the wind at their back anymore right now. So they really need to be extra cautious about what they're getting into and make sure that that underwriting is really solid and make sure that they're stress testing everything and, you know, thinking about every possible contingency that comes up. Um, so, you know, just, just be, be extra careful these days is, is what I would say. Well, how can the listeners reach out to you, Jonathan, if they have some further questions for you about this portfolio or if they uh, want, to want to continue to follow you a little bit further? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways. Uh, if you are thinking of investing, um, I will be back in the markets when things look good. I'm still building my investor base. So if you would like to talk to me about that, you can reach me at uh, Twombly, uh, T-W-O-M-B-L-Y, at twobridgesmanagement.com. Um, that's two bridges spelled out in MGMT for management. So Twombly, two bridges management.com. You can also just look at our website. Uh, I also have a paid coaching group. And if you're interested in learning about that, that is www.multifamilylaunchpad.org. And you can get a free download there called the ultimate checklist to buying your first hundred unit property with other people's money and getting paid to do it. Uh, so go download that for free and join my email list. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us here this afternoon, Jonathan. Looking forward to continuing to follow you and also looking forward to having you on a future podcast when you get back in the market and you start acquiring more properties. Well, always good talking with you, Dan. I always enjoy it. So thank yep. you. You as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.